Hi, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for being with us today. My name is Guidance Kandemiri, and today we are talking about the elevation matrix. What does it? What happens when God raises a man? What happens when God makes a man? And what is the process that leads to the transformation of an individual, um, the amalgamation of a person, the when God t- puts you together and he elevates you, and what is the process for that? And we're going to be jumping into the scripture we're not reading a scripture um, right off the bat um, as a conversation because we are looking at the life of Joseph and we're examining the life of Joseph as we see how he um, rose from being a young man that was tending to sheep with his brothers to becoming a head of state and someone who was very influential in his time. And um, right up to the journey that he had, his experiences with God and what led him through that process of elevation. He and many others in scripture, such as David and so forth, are people whose story um, demonstrate an elevation, a, a, a journey with God that led to a process of elevation. And today I'm going to be sharing with you three laws, three laws that are essential for your elevation as a person in your life, as a believer, in your Christian walk and in life. These, these are rules that apply across the board from not just in a, in a Christian setting, but in a, in a global uh, setting as well. And I want to start very, very importantly by highlighting how God has traditionally developed people. Um, one of the key focuses of any church in our time should be the process of discipleship. And I emphasize discipleship very extensively in my life because I believe that this is one of the things that scripture continues to push us towards what we call the great commission is Jesus sending us out to do discipleship, not to win souls, not to get people in a building, but to make people into what God wants them to be. And so there has to be a commitment on our part to understand what discipleship is. The first person to disciple was Christ himself. He calls the 12 and he invested in them. He poured in them. And what led, what that became was these men became men that were Uh, taught, made, and molded, and elevated. Useless young men um, with nothing and no hope and, and, you know, just average people were transformed into incredible prophets, people we read about and people we see who did incredible things in the kingdom of God because of that process. So when we start, we can never start about talking about elevation without discipleship. Um, Even in the space of business and in conversations of business circles, they tell you to get a mentor. What they're essentially trying to push you towards is some kind of discipleship that we have to then start start first by being discipled. But I like I like the word discipleship because I think it's important that we understand what discipleship is as we uh, transition into our first law. Um, discipleship starts first with the relationship that Christ had with his disciples. I love something absolutely phenomenal and I want, I want to share this with you as, as a thought uh, wherever you are. Scripture says Christ walked up to these people who we can assume they knew him to some extent. I mean, he had been around the block. This is someone who grew up within their communities and so forth. And the first thing he says to them is, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the first thing that they did is they left everything they were doing and they started following him. This is very curious. This is very curious because I think that we have to trust the brand in order for us to leave everything we know and everything we've done to follow somebody. This is very critical um, if you really think about it. And I've always used this as an example. If one of the wealthiest people in the world walked up to you and said, hey, listen, if you come with me, I'll make you a, a millionaire, you would go. You would leave your job. You would leave what you know because you trust the brand. You trust the person who's speaking to you. You trust the model of what they do. Now, I would like to think that these people left what they left because they trusted the brand that Christ had. That when, when Yeshua is speaking to these people, his brand resonated with them. They wanted to be like him. And I know in, in one of our messages, we were sharing 10 things you don't know about Jesus. Uh, one of the things we, we said in there, which was very clear, is that his 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 gift or his his vocation was actually not not uh, carpentry but most likely a builder they would have had to trust his workmanship in order for them to leave whatever they knew in order to follow them so we 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 cannot be elevated if we are not following trusted models of discipleship you can never find elevation if you do not follow trusted or or known models of discipleship and so the question that i always ask somebody when when they say 
help me or or mentor me or teach me the first question i always ask is what do you want to be transformed into because um what journey are you on and what is the outcome of that journey because a lot of people want to go on a journey but they don't have an outcome in mind and they don't have an an expectation of what they will become these people were told that they would become fishers of men and to them it made absolute sense to leave their careers leave their jobs leave their livelihoods and pursue and follow this one person into whatever he had that's phenomenal that's actually quite amazing and and it 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 does demonstrate an absolute trust of the brand but also a trust of the outcome that i am going to be a fisher of men i don't know what that means to them or what rather what it meant to them contextually but they trusted enough to leave their careers their jobs their hopes their families and say we're going to follow this guy wherever he's going and we trust whatever he is making us into but now the reason why this conversation matters in in light of what we're talking about is because a lot of people are man made a lot of people are man made a lot of people are making themselves they are they are giving themselves do overs they dress different they speak different they they study and and they 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 want to show up in the best way that another man can do for me and very few people in the process of our elevation ever ask what can god make me this is a, a very important thing i learned earlier in my life the limitations of people in elevating you they can all, only elevate you as far as they can go um a, a millionaire can only make you what they are a a a a successful person can only make you that it doesn't necessarily mean that they are successful in everything else i've learned also uh, certain people are successful in marriage they're not necessarily successful in business some, some people are successful in industry but they're not so successful in relationships and and their lack in those areas is imprinted on us and one of the things i'm starting to learn now in my life is to become god made what does it mean in my elevation in my growth to where i'm going to trust god to make me so it leads me to the first um law which is called the law of process the law of process god works through process if god is going to make you what you are he's going to work through a process and i'm intrigued and one of the things i've been praying about and, and even when i read the word and I, i i see i see what happens when god makes a man what happens when god makes a man we see that through the life of of joseph we see that through the life of david we see moses we see all of these people that were god made there was something supernatural about it it's not just the process that led to them being exceptional in life but rather a process that led them to be exceptional all round and god wants us to go through the process because process makes man he knows that once he is done with you you are you are completely well well done you are well rounded in every aspect of your life and but the problem is we often never really elevate because most of us are not willing to go through the process we are fighting the process and and uh you know i'm learning in my life to 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 be in a place where god allows me to go through the process there are certain things that you need to go through in order for for god to make you what he wants to make you and there are certain things that you need to go through in order for you to get elevation and those things require process it you can't dodge it you can't run away from it and when we understand scripture we understand the scripture say, teaches us that we must be building precept upon precept and 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 a uh, idea upon idea revelation upon a re- upon revelation knowledge upon knowledge and so god wants to take us through the process of grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 grade 5 until you're ready to get to the next level but a lot of us are trying to skip through certain things we don't want to experience pain and we don't want to experience suffering and we don't want to experience heartbreak we don't want to know what rejection feels like or neglect what neglect feels like we don't want to know what it like what it's like to be alone we don't want to go there um if 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 god doesn't give us the money to do it and so there are all these reasons that stop us from getting to the next level of our life because we're not willing to embrace the process and so the starting point for us as believers working in the matrix of elevation god elevate me take me to the next level take me to the next level in my prayer life take me to the next level in my obedience it starts first by me submitting myself to the process that he's putting me into rather than fighting it and the reason why a lot of people don't graduate this is very important is because you ran away from grade 1 
And so every single time grade one level problems come up, you keep falling down over and over again. And some people are eager. They are running up to grade two, grade three, but they still don't have the fundamentals of grade one. And so your battles never end at that level. You never break through past that level. You never win past that level because you were never willing to subject yourself to the process that God wants to take you through. If you want to be elevated, it starts from submitting yourself to process. Then it begs the question, is every unpleasant thing that happened in my life bad? Are there specific assignments that were sanctioned by God, but unpleasant for me? How do I differentiate between what's meant to destroy me and what's meant to grow me? Because remember, sometimes in, in some of life's most painful moments, God was teaching me. God was putting me in process. Look at the life of David. At some point, the Bible tells us he pretended to be mad so the Philistines wouldn't kill him and he started drooling and, and all of that. These are low moments of his life. At some point, he went into a cave and all these losers and wife beaters and these guys that absconded from payments and people that failed in every aspect of their life came to him. Imagine at, at the lowest point in your life, you continue to attract losers. And someone would ask the question, but God, why do I keep attracting losers in my life? He keeps attracting these people. Imagine I'm the king of Israel. You, I was anointed. I was, I was appointed by God. God chose me and God elected me into this place. But somehow still, I still attract nothing but losers. Imagine Joseph in all the processes of his life. I, I have different versions of Joseph that I always refer to. Number one, Joseph at home, servant to his brothers. He's a dreamer. He's loved and protected by his father but he's completely insignificant. And then we have Joseph in the pit. He has now been rejected by his brethren. He has now been thrown away by people he loves. He is separated. He's unprotected. The protection is gone. He's uncertain about his future. He's ready to die. He has braced himself for the worst that could possibly happen. And the next thing we see Joseph in Potiphar's house, a little bit of elevation, a little bit of respect, He's now self-made. He has built an excellent reputation. You know, he he's, people know him and people respect him and they revere him in the spaces that they know him from, from. And all of this, then we see him again. Now he's in jail. He has been shamed. The community knows him as a sleaze. They know him as a pervert, a, 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 a rapist. He has been labeled all these things. He has been accused. He has been forgotten. You know, again, people have forgotten about him. The people that used to remember him. And I mean, you know, he, he interpreted a, a dream and he's like, you know, hook me up. This is what I do. Whenever you go anywhere, if there's favor for me, get me a, a slot. And the person that was supposed to give him a slot forgot about him. Forgotten thrown away, discarded, accused. And in that place, we again see, now he again has been appointed. Now again, there is forgiveness. He's learning to trust process. What, but what made this journey unique? It made, what made his journey unique is, in, in it all, he had a relationship with process. He understood that this is where things are right now, but there's an outcome that I'm working at that matters more. One of the biggest hindrances to, to elevation is because we, we, we go two centimeters and we take a measurement. We, we, we measure. How far have I gone? And we take two centimeters and, and we measure. Earlier, a friend of mine saw my daughter and he, says, he said to me, she has grown. She has grown. We don't notice growth because we have her every day. I don't wake up in the morning and notice that she has grown two centimeters. I don't. What I do is I, I am experiencing my job, my responsibilities in that time, in that process is to make sure she is fed, is to make sure she has everything she needs. And growth is a result of process. The problem is a lot of us are trying every day to get on the scale and to check how much weight we've lost. And we're trying to get on the scale and to check how much uh, growth we, we have. What, what more do I know today that I didn't know yesterday? Um, how much more money did, do I have today that I didn't have yesterday? Uh, how many more friends have I gained? How many more followers do I have? And so we measure our growth not by the process that we go through, but by the little metrics that we think define growth. And we get stuck there. And so, Dave, so, so Joseph, David, all these men did not have a slight steady growth into it. They had process. And sometimes the process sucks. Sometimes the process is unbearable. Sometimes the process is hard. But learning to trust God when I'm, I'm, I'm having my ups and, I'm, and my downs and my, my lifts and my rights and my, 
my backs and my forth forwards and 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 all of these processes come back to the point that no matter what's happening i'm getting to an outcome and so we have to learn to to get to that place i love one thing about the the i think the biggest lesson i've learned from the life of joseph is forgiveness i think in all of this the hardest thing that that he had to learn was to forgive can, can you imagine having to forgive your brothers firstly for throwing you in there can you imagine having to forgive potiphar's wife can you imagine having to forgive the the dude that forgot you in jail after you helped him out and you 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 interpreted his dream and he forgot about you until years later this guy just forgot about him forgiving is it is it and and I'm, it makes me curious is it is it possible that forgiveness is easier to give because we learn more we learn more about how grace has been given to us as well i mean joseph had to have a revelation of grace i i consider unforgiveness to be similar to entitlement in that we will never extend mercy to others while we ourselves um have received it from god you know that's entitlement it it means i have received mercy but i won't grant it to you is the same as as david and he's being challenged by the prophet nathan and and the prophet asks him and he says to him there's a man who 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 had the exact same story he gave him a similar story but he gave him a, an analogy of sheep and and so forth and david says bring that man here let me sort him out right now and th- then the prophet says it's you it's funny because we are entitled to the mercy and the forgiveness of god but we want to extend it to others so these journeys then unlock our capacity to be more i believe that the journey unlocked joseph's capacity to be more you know i being a father taught me to be patient it i couldn't there was nothing else in my life that taught me patience you know it's hard to be patient with kids they just running up and down in the they're doing all i mean your child a child can look you right in the eye and do exactly what you told them not to do it teaches you our attitude towards god we know exactly what not to do you know what you're doing when you send an sms you know a late night sms or you netflix netflixing and chilling you know what you're doing you know what you're doing when you're sinning against god everybody knows and we we it's like we're looking him right in the eye and saying what you going to do you know but here's the, the revelation certain journeys unlock capacity so the process is necessary they unlock our capacity to be more joseph had to go through this to learn forgiveness is hard to that that your parents would bow bow to you and even when they did bow to him he wasn't proud and arrogant he had already learned forgiveness he had learned process he had been betrayed by many others he had he had been let down he was already a better man for it and so when they came to bow to him it wasn't a place of arrogance but rather a moment where he says it's okay i forgive you This is why James says something I'm going to read this very quickly from the book of James. He's saying knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let faith let let patience apologies but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. The process of being patient produces completion. There is nothing worse than having a half-baked preacher standing in front of you when i say half baked i mean they have they have no idea what the process is they can tell you what the book says but they haven't experienced it there's nothing worse than having a doctor straight out of college they've got a little pen and a book and a little portfolio and they tell you i've never actually healed anybody i've never worked with anybody i've never been tutored i've never been trained and discipled but i've read all the books i've got you it's not safe we trust it when people come in they say i have been tested and proven i have gone through the pits and the sand and the the sadness and i've been discarded i've been spit on and i've been despised i've been hated i've been protested i've been thrown away i've been hated and in all that i have become consistent in what god has led me to be we trust process and so james says that it produces completion that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing The reason why popcorn ministries and popcorn visions and popcorn marriages and popcorn lives don't work is because they have not experienced process. And so if you want to be elevated in your life number 1, go through the law of process. Number 2, you must go through the law of sacrifice. 
the law of sacrifice. The reason why this this one particularly matters is because I've learned um, that certain experiences are given to mature us. That's true. But if we avoid them, we remain unprepared. And the next level rem- demands sacrifice. I want you to write that down. The next level demands sacrifice. The next level demands sacrifice. Why is this important? If you look at the, the, the program of athletes and so forth, and these guys that are um, actively com- or competitively um, in, in competitive environments, the one rule that sets them apart is not often the skill or the gifting or how good one person is. The, what usually sets them apart is how much they sacrifice to get there. It's the waking up early in the morning to go jogging and the, the, the amount of time and exercise we put in, in, in doing what we do. It's, it's <clears throat> stuff we do on our own because we have to give up something. It's, it's them realizing that their diet has to change and them realizing that they can't spend all day watching TV anymore and they can't spend all that time doing whatever they wanted to do. That the next level that they need to get to demands that something be sacrificed. In fact, one of the things that I, 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 I'm beginning to understand, even as we are speaking right now, is the law of elevation demands that you give away your weight. Can I say that in a different way? You cannot go up if you're carrying weight. Certain heights require that the stuff that we carry um, must be removed. So the law of elevation demands that weight must be shifted out in order for us to shift up. And so it, it means that we have to remove the stuff that, that usually weighs down on us and, and we have to be willing to give up something. How do you get to the next level of your life if you're not willing to give up the friends that stop you from getting there? How do you get to the next level of your life if you're not willing to give up the unsanctified relationships, unsanctified ambitions, unsanctified uh, pursuits, the, the things that split our focus and, and all the entertainment that we love and all the things that we have often chased that have removed us or deviated us from what we need to do. A lot of people are struggling to get to the next level because the challenge is you just are not willing to give up something for it. And, and so what happens is holding on to things keeps us on the same level. Petty agendas keep businesses from growing. Bitterness keeps us from healing. Anger keeps us from moving forward. Criticism stops us from learning. And so there's certain people that should be learning from you, but they are busy criticizing you. I've learned to be very careful to be critical of people we should be learning from. You know, earlier in my life, I was so quick to criticize. And and the reason why that was so natural for me is I thought you should do it. You should do it this way. It's funny because when, when you're watching a football match, Everybody thinks, you know, this guy should have just turned left and shot the ball. But you, you're not an athlete. You don't, you don't understand the decision that he made in that moment. And so it's easy for us to build criticism instead of learning. And so a, a lot of our response in our lives has become to watch, to find what's wrong with what's going on, as opposed for us to watch to say, what did I learn from this experience? What did I learn from this experience? And that stops us from being elevated, I'm learning now to understand sacrifice to mean three things. In order for you to sacrifice, there has to be a price. In order for you to sacrifice, there has to be a cost. In order for you to sacrifice, there has to be a process. There's a process of doing it or a ritual around sacrifice. In in scripture, you would find that whenever people came to bring an offering before God, they would do that. Number one, they would come to bring their animal before the altar. And their animal was supposed to be brought without blemish, the best of their crop or the best of their, their, their herd. And they're supposed to bring this and put it on the altar to present a sacrifice before God. Number two, this is both the price and the cost. And I'll explain that later. And third, and most importantly, they were supposed to do the ritual in a certain way. There's a way that, that which we give sacrifice, right? Not all sacrifices are equal. And so the secret to that is the methods. I'll, I'll give you an example. In love, we are taught that there are many love languages. So this means that when I demonstrate love to my wife, I demonstrate love to her by... Uh, as many sacrificial methods. And whether it's time, I sacrifice to give her time. There's a way to do it. And whether it is acts of service, I do that to sacrifice my energy, my focus, my time to demonstrate that to her. So all kinds, all kinds of sacrifice have a form. 
They have a structure. They have a way in which they are done, in which they we respond to them. Now, I want you to stay with me and I want you to hear me as much as you can um, on this. A, a very interesting thing that happened. Christ walks into the, the temple. As he walks into the temple, he finds the, the, the money changers selling in there. All right. All these men are selling in the in their temple. And as they are selling in the temple, something phenomenal immediately happens to him. He gets angry. And scripture tells us that he he turns out tables, drives out the herds, and everything. Now, when we read the scripture, he says something interesting. He says to, to them that you have stolen. He, he, he called them thieves. You have turned my father's house into a den of thieves. And I, I was having a conversation with a friend and I asked them, so what what who is he referring to? The money changes because they are obviously selling at a rate that works. There's, an, you know, if I'm selling, you either buy or you don't. My price, I set my price and you buy based on my overheads and what I'm experiencing. And you purchase based on the fact that it works for you or not. But I want you to get this revelation very quickly. The reason why Christ overturned the tables was not because of the money changes. He was breaking this and he accused them of being a, it being a den of thieves because he was accusing those that come to buy of being the thieves. The revelation is this. These people did not understand these three laws, the three laws of sacrifice. Number one, if I'm coming to present my sheep, God wanted them to carry this thing on you, to, 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 to push it from your house to, to the temple and to offer the sacrifice there. But what they didn't understand is that there are three things that constitute the sacrifice. Number one, first thing that constitutes the sacrifice is the price. So yes, you bought the sheep for 50 rand, doesn't matter, all right? You paid $100 for this sheep and that's what you're going to offer to God. That's not the problem. The problem is these people would come from their houses just with cash and come and buy the offering at the temple. They didn't have the experience of paying the costs. Remember, there's, yes, there's a price for the sheep, but they didn't pay the costs. The cost is the journey, is, is how heavy it is to carry that sheep from your house. 100 kilometers away, 50 kilometers away to come to the temple to give it. That struggle, that suffering was supposed to be your indication to God that God, I appreciate. I know what it took for you to bring me here. And so me bringing this thing as hard as it is, is a sign of my understanding and my, my sacrifice to come to you with my sin. Sin is heavy. And so the cost of sin must be paid, which is me coming before the throne of God and saying, I, 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 I emptied before you. This thing has been exhausting me. It's been heavy on me for the past few days. I had to walk with my sin from my house and to come with my sin here to present it before you. They were not willing to do that. And so these people that came into the, the altar, they had paid the price for the sheep, yes, but they didn't know how to pay the cost for it. And so what you have now in this equation are people coming into the temple of God only to present the form of the offering. Yes, we put it on the fire and we light the fire and we say, God, we are giving you an offering. And yes, I paid for it at the door, but I don't know the cost of coming here with it. What am I saying? I'm saying that there's a difference when we understand sacrifice. We have to understand that there are certain things that must be given up. There are certain things that must be laid down. There are certain things that must cost me something. There has to be something that it costs me. So I, I always ask people, what does it cost you? You see, going, when I, when I work for my kids, and, and, and I mean, African parents, I love this. I want to give this an example and I'll give it. So when we were kids, our parents used to discipline us when we left things out and at school, like you forgot your bag or you left your shoes or, or something, we used to get like a, a nice hiding because of that. And we, we didn't understand that. We thought, we thought I'm being beaten because I left expensive shoes. You see, the shoes cost a certain price. There's a price for the shoes. So we know what they cost to replace at the store. But the reason why our parents were upset was we, we knew the price Maybe we may, may or may not have known the price, but we didn't know the costs. The cost is the amount of hours it took them to work and make this work for us. The amount of time they invested in, in, in getting this money and, and getting these resources when things were hard, the sacrifices they went through, there's a cost to that. It's sleepless nights. It's, it's, so you're not being beaten because you lost 100 rand shoes. You're not being beaten for that. You are being beaten because you don't know what it took me 
to get that for you the first time around and how hard we are working to put food on the table. And that's the difference between price and costs. So a lot of people are willing to pay, pay the price for success, but very few people are willing to pay the costs of success to go through the hard times and the, the hardships and to sleep late and to, to wake up early and to, to put in your best and to work harder than everybody else, to be the last to punch out and to do all of that stuff. A lot of people are not willing to sacrifice to make it work. And I'm learning that even in the process of sac sacrificing, that not all opportunities are mine. They're not all opportunities are mine. I'm, I must learn to differentiate between my distractions and my opportunities. And, and there are certain times that distractions come looking like opportunities and I jump on them and I think that I'm going to make this work and it doesn't come as it's supposed to because what it's doing is defying the law of sacrifice. Something must be given up in order for me to be elevated. You know, in your walk with God, in your journey with God, it must cost you something. There's something that you must be willing to walk away from. And people that say they are willing to sacrifice for you but are not willing to let go of the cost are not different from people that came to the temple with Christ and say, hey, God, I love you so much. I want to honor you. I want to show you reverence. Thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving me all the wealth that I have. But guess what? I would rather do that on someone else's labor than for me to do it out of my own effort. David says, I will not offer to God something that did not cost me something. There has to be a cost that I'm willing to pay. The word opp opportunity cost comes up a lot in business because basically every opportunity you take will cost you something else. It means that, that um, every new relationship that I make will cost me another one. Essentially, if I'm doing a job with a specific client, I cannot do another one with someone else. It's, it's something has to be given for, for me to take something. Essentially, your hands are full. And so if you're going to take something else, you're going to have to put down what you're holding to take that. That's essentially how I, I understand that. Malcolm Gladwell explains something incredible in one of his books, uh, one of my favorite authors. Um, he explains that you can only really handle about 150 genuine, authentic, close connections. Nothing more than 150. Which means every time you add on to that, you are making, you have to create room by getting rid of certain people. And so the question then becomes in your journey to elevation and what God is leading you and what God is doing in your life, what do you have to give up? Who do you have to give up? Abraham had to give up Lot. Certain people had to give up certain opportunities. Um, there are certain things that you have to let go of. You can't be in Canaan and still want to be in Egypt. So you have to give up Egypt for you to transition to Canaan. All of these experiences we have demand that something be given up. Are you willing to sacrifice something for the next level that God has set for you? I love when God, God makes stuff. When we are talking about the discipleship process, God doesn't say, I, I want to create. He says, I will make you. Jesus says to them, I will make you fishers of men, right? I will make you. I will make you. I will make you. The thing about making is, and I've learned this, making is a series of dis dis deconstructing and reconstructing. Um, if I want to make soup, I have to be willing to break onions and tomatoes and, and all these little things that I need to be willing to break in order for me to make something. So if I'm making a house, we have to, bring soil and we have to bring cement and concrete and we have to break certain things and then put them back together in order. The, the process of making means breaking down to rebuild in an orderly fashion. The revelation of this is this. You, you will never make something if you are unwilling to break. You are never going to create something meaningful if your ingredients are not willing to be broken. And if you are unwilling to break a couple of eggs, I, th I think this is the, the saying, right? You can't make omelets without breaking a couple of eggs. There has to be a sacrifice you're willing to make for the level that God is taking you. And it starts first by you being willing to break your ingredients, your relationships. There are certain people I don't need in my close-knit group, but this group is, is dysfunctional. So let me shift out certain people. Let me bring in certain people. Let me build the right connections. Let me let go of certain habits and certain ways of doing things in order for me to find elevation. It requires that something be broken in order for us to build something. You cannot get elevation without sacrifice. Number three. Number three, as I close, uh, my last point as I close, the law of expectation. I said to you earlier when we started that it's important that you know what you are being made into. There has to be an expectation on a discipler 
um, to say, I expect you to become, or a disciple to say, I will, I hope to be, I hope to become. There has to be a, 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 a profound expectation in terms of where life will lead us and what our expectations will be. I've said to you before, and I think I've shared this, that a farmer who sows without going back to check on his crop is not a farmer. What makes a farmer a farmer is the expectation of crop. He goes back to the same spot over and over again to check on his crop because he's expecting something to come out of it. If you don't do that, then you are simply wasteful. So the actual difference between a farmer and, and, a, uh, and a wasteful person is the expectation, is the fact that he wakes up in the morning to go right back to the same spot and check on the seed that they have. They're expecting fruit out of it. I've always said to people, um, even in church environments, when you give, you are giving to God, give with expectation because you are sowing in the kingdom of God. If you are sowing in the kingdom of God, give with expectation. We're not throwing away. We're not just, just putting it there. We are planting it. And so my expectation is to come back and to say that something will come out of it. I expect that every investment will be nurtured and that the police, the, the process that I'm policing will produce fruit. Because if it's not, then it's dead. If I'm not policing the process, if I'm not going back to check and make sure that everything is the way it's supposed to be, then technically speaking, I will get nothing out of it. Let's, let's, let's bring this back down. A lot of people I know plan well. They plan to be great and they, 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 they plan to have good plans and they plan to go far in the future and they plan to make money and they plan to get married and they plan to, to be fathers and, and mothers and they plan to start homes and families, but they never follow through. And the reason why they do that is because nobody is present to help them police that process. The next level of, 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 of elevation is a, a level of accountability that we need to walk into where our expectation is the key to our success. Expectation forces me to water my seed. Expectation forces me to remove weeds. Expectation forces me to build my life. Expectation forces me to become accountable to the process. Expectation makes me get ready. When I'm expecting a new baby, you, I go and I buy clothes and I prepare for, for them. When they arrive, I want to make sure that the, there's a room that's ready. I want to make sure that there's space that's ready. I'm going to buy a cart and I'm going to buy diapers. What that does is it brings up a sense of accountability that allows us to grow. A lot of people struggle to get to the next level because there is no sense of expectation. We planted the seeds, the baby is coming, but nobody's thinking about buying clothes. We planted the seeds, the marriage is coming, but nobody's thinking, how do I manage a home? How do I manage a marriage? We planted the seeds, yes. We, we spoke to the girl, the girl said yes. So we're walking down the aisle on a certain date, an agreed date, but there's no structure in terms of how do I make a marriage work? And so what happens is that we approach everything that God has given us without expectation. And it doesn't work. The next level of our life, needs a sense of expectation. What happens when God begins to tell you what you are? You see, what I, lo what I love about these men that we are reading, David, Joseph, and, and all these guys, they expected that out of the future. And in spite, of, in spite of where they were and the experiences they went into on the places they went into, they were expecting it. They worked their gifts. They kept studying. They were diligent in what they were doing. They prepared for what was happening. You see David in the, in the, in the forest looking after sheep and still every day he was practicing. He understood his, his tools. He understood his apparatus. There was, a, there was a focus in there as a product of expectation. It's different when you expect nothing. If you want God to elevate you, what do you expect? The disciples were called and they knew, I am going to be a fisher of man and I'm going to be this. And this is what he's going to make me. There was a clearly outlined outcome. And so they knew that. And so every morning they would wake up and go and listen at his feet. Every morning they would wake up and go and find out what is he, what does he have for us today? What is he teaching us today? And that simply says, I want to become what you expect of me. I want to become what you expect of me. And this is one of the reasons why we find struggle with these men. And I believe the enemy of expectations is excuses. The enemy of expectation is excuses. When you don't expect anything, you make excuses for it. You're not ready for what God wants to do. So consistently you make layers, layers of excuses. 
I found it's it's not it's not just one thing that stops someone from succeeding. It's layers of it. It's layers of of statements. The economy is bad, but it's not just the economy that's bad. It's you know, it's clients are also terrible, you know, but it's not just clients that are a problem. You know, I, I, if I had capital, I would go further. It's not just that, but there's corruption in the government and in, in, in the tender side of things and in, in business relationships. It's not just that, ah, oh, white people don't like to work with me because I'm black or black people don't like to work with me because I'm white. And it's not just that it's, 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 um, Certain people don't like me because I am I am this and that. Ah, it's not just that. It's people don't understand me. They're not they don't understand my product. And and it's not just that. It's I wish I had a salesperson. And so we stagger layers of reasons why we don't expect from God, why we cannot get to the next level. But the secret to that is what am I expecting? And how do I consistently make sure that what I'm expecting comes through? I want to I wanna give you quick, quick points even as I'm just running by as I close. We don't elevate because we don't know why we should elevate. We don't know why we should elevate. There's no reason. We're not motivated to get to the next level. We don't elevate because we don't practice smaller elevations. We don't grow in small bits and pieces. We don't grow because we don't have destinations. I think I shared this earlier. That a lot of us need to know where we are going. What is going to make God going to make me? What does elevation look like for me? How do I measure it when I get there? We don't elevate because we lack the intention of elevating. We don't have the intention, the desire to do so. We, we, it's not an intentional thing for us. We, we go there by mistake. We, we're not actively striving. God, take me to this level of my life because I'm ready for that. We, are, we, we, are, we succumb to whatever life brings us. And lastly, we don't often elevate because we use the wrong vehicles for it. We, we elevate using the wrong mechanisms and the wrong tools. And we don't use the right relationships. We don't use the right connections. We don't use the right um, environments that pro propel us to become elevated. Today, my message to you is, is on the life of Joseph whose life we watch. Most of us have read this and that's why we didn't read the text today. We watch the lives of people like Joseph and Joseph who has gone through the process until he finally says, God, I am here. You brought me here and I'm grateful that you brought me here. And a lot of us, for whatever reason, we are watching this and maybe it's money, maybe it's wealth, maybe it's, it's building a home or building a ministry, building a life um, or just your Christ walk. There are so many things stopping you from, being, from elevating. And years into your relationship with God, there's a consistency. There's a, there's a ceiling that you keep hitting and you don't know why you keep hitting it. I want you to shift these three things in your life. Number one, shift, develop a sense of sacrifice. Give something up. Give something up. There has to be something that has to go. Number two, number two, and very importantly, expect, expect it. And as you expect it, Put in the steps necessary for you to get to where God wants you to be. What do I need to implement today that helps me get what I expect? I expect a million. Okay, great. You expect a million. How are we going to get a million? And so what kind of life do I have to live? So I have to put in the sacrifice. And I have to put in the work to get there. And most importantly, on days when I have losses, I still wake up and I work. On days when I have no followers, I still wake up and work. On days when nobody celebrates me, I still wake up and work. On days when I make losses and I, I have nothing else to give and I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I want to rest and, I, and I've given it my all, but nobody's seeing what I've done. I still wake up and I do that because in that, I become holistic. God is interested in your journey, the journey that makes you complete, that makes you holistic, not the journey, not the outcome only, but the journey matters. And I want you to, to, to urge you, I want to remind you to go back to the journey, go through the walk and say, God, let's walk, let's do this. Let's, let's get elevated. Let's go to the next level. Let's work what we need to work until we get there. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Um, continue to follow, share, like, and tell someone about this and bless someone with this message.